just another second. Oh, people got in the room fast. That's great. All right, um, I think we'll begin right now. Hello, everybody, good evening. Welcome to PNP Live. Um, my name is Beth Wong. I'm on the events team at Politics and Prose, and we thank you so much for joining us here tonight to celebrate Katie Letary's new book, Dark Things I Adore, in conversation with Sarah Langan. At any time during the event today, you can click on the link that I'm going to post in the chat to purchase copies of um, Dark Things I Adore from Politics and Prose. In addition to growing your own library, a book sale from Politics and Prose means that we at the store are, keep, uh, are able to keep bringing you content like this, um, content that we're so proud to be able to bring to our community. You can ask our author a question tonight by submitting it to the Q&A box, the button for which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Be sure to submit it in the Q&A and not in the chat to make sure that we can see it. Uh, this evening, as you may notice, we are offering live auto captioning. To turn that on or off, go to the little arrow on the CC button below or to the settings of your Zoom mobile app. Um, and if you have any trouble with that, I can help you um, just send me a message in the chat. I will waste no more time getting to the main event tonight. Um, a searing psychological thriller of trauma, dark academia, complicity and revenge, dark things I adore unravels the realities behind campfire legends, the horrors that happen in the dark, the girls who become cautionary tales and the guilty who go unpunished until now. Katie Letary holds degrees from the University of Maine and the University of Notre Dame. Her first novel, American Vaudeville, was published in 2016 and had previously been a semifinalist in Subido Press's annual fiction contest in 2013. Her short fiction has been published in such places as NOO Journal, The Bend, Stolen Island, Call, uh, Cabildo, sorry, uh, Quarterly, Pennsylvania English, The Writing Disorder, and more. Her short, her short story, No Protections, Only Powers, was a finalist in the Neoverse short story writing competition and later anthologized in Threads, a Neoverse anthology. Sarah Langan is the award-winning author of Good Neighbors, among other works, and a founding board member of the Shirley Jackson Awards. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University and a master's in environmental health science and toxicology from New York University. Welcome both of you. Um, we're so excited for this. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, Katie, I love this book. And um, it is beautifully nuanced and patient and rich. And the characters, there's this giant cast of characters and every one of them is unique and specific. And you do it over two separate timelines. And it's a majestic feat. And it's also a page turner. And you love thrillers and I love thrillers. Yeah. So I wondered if you might wanna talk a little bit about, you know, give, give, give the pitch on dark things I adore. Sure. So first of all, I want to thank Politics and Prose. I want to thank Sarah so much for being here. This is like so exciting. I'm such a fan of Sarah and I'm um, thrilled to be here. Thank you for everybody for coming to this event. This is super exciting. It's my first event ever like this. So I'm really excited for this. Um, so yeah, Dark Things I Adore um, is a revenge thriller and it's set across two timelines, like Sarah was saying. And in one timeline set in 1988, there's this sort of eclectic um, eccentric group of artists who are cloistered away at this place called the Lupin Valley Arts Collective in remote Maine. And um, sort of what starts as sort of this interesting, fun, but intense group turns into a group filled with secrets. And then there's a death. And um, there's this really dark secret that gets um, captured between this group of people. And then in 2018, we have this gifted art student named Audra Colfax, who's getting her MFA in painting from the Boston Institute for the Visual Arts. And she has lured her manipulative professor, Max Durant, up to her home in Maine. And, um, you know, the cover for why she's invited him there is um, to see her thesis paintings and Max secretly is really hoping it's because he senses this real vibe between them. He really thinks that they're going to hook up and he's really hopeful for that. Um, but Audra has much darker, uh, much more harrowing plans in store for them. And as the book rolls along, you kind of see how what happened in 1988 really dovetails and intersects with what is about to happen on this one weekend in Maine in 2018. 
It's masterfully done. It's like Thank really you. well done. That's so nice. <laughs> you play so well with the timelines. Um, so I know that you love thrillers. Um, what brought you to writing this book specifically? Yeah, so I have written a lot of different types of things. I think like most writers, you kind of dabble in a lot of different stuff. I think when I was a lot younger, I was into poetry and then I kind of moved into fiction and um, got in really into sort of uh, fan fiction and stuff like that, which is such a fun proving ground and play time for any writer, I think. And then uh, I went into college and uh, my and graduate program. So I was focusing on fiction and really into sort of innovative and fresh and kind of experimental fiction. And I really uh, was into folks like Julia Elliott is really brilliant and um, just really kind of these great female writers who have this kind of dark edge under sort of their their beautiful mastery of what they're up to and um, I, I tried writing a couple different types of books to greater or less success in terms of how I felt about them and how agents felt about them and, and onward and then um, in 2017 after like a lot of soul searching and like therapy honestly <laughs> where I was trying to figure out like who I was and what I wanted and um, having a lot of angst about what kind of writer I wanted to be I realized you know I really love true crime I really love thrillers I really love mystery I'm I'm taking all of those things in all the time via podcasts and books and tv shows and I was like why am I not writing the stuff that I'm so into and consuming all the time and so that's what brought me to try to write a thriller and so that's what dark things adore uh, the dark things I adore turned into was was from that sort of nugget of like self-actualization of realizing what I wanted to do and then um, it started off with a painter in the beginning it was a very different story when I first started writing it but it had a painter in it and it had a professor in it and it had a student in it and um, sort of who does what changed over drafts and drafts and drafts but I love the idea of um, a visual medium being used to kind of play as a foil to what's happening in the plot I guess I can there's there's moments in this book for those of you because it's it's not on sale yet it's like on sale right now um there's these beautiful descriptions of 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 art pieces that are is so well done Thank you. um yeah yeah um and and I thought a little bit of Gillian Flynn as I was reading this mm. the sort of okay. plot twisty things and then there's also the the male female point of view that's so humorously different <laughs> yes you know like max is this character who is the professor and he's so out of touch with what's actually happening yeah <laughs> it's amazing it is. yeah no it's really true um you know i think what's fun about audra and max who sort of really kind of propel sort of the plot and the action, especially in the sort of thread that's happening in present day, which is 2018 in the book is that they're both so sure about what they think they know. And they're so sure about what this weekend is going to be. And really only one of them really knows what's going on. But the confidence <laughs> is incredible on both sides of what the expectations are and what um, people feel entitled to, what Max feels entitled to from Audra. It, it feels like a feminist work to me, mm. this book. And yeah. I, it feels like you're exploring ideas of entitlement, of power, and mm. notions of who gets to tell a story. Mm. Because even though we're, we're, we're thinking that we're all woke, we're not. And what's fun is like you show in pieces of the past this, this artist colony where the men are the dominant voices. Mm. And then you show the present where the man in here is still the dominant voice. And he's retelling these stories of ways he's treated students. And then from Audra's perspective, and that's his student, you also get these retellings that are horrendous, but are also still happening. Yeah, no, it's true. I think... Um... With Max, you know, he is a force. And I think a lot of the times with men who are able to sort of manipulate, especially men who have 
positions of power or there's a charisma a lot of the time, not all the time, but there is a charisma a lot of the time with um, predators. And I would say Max sort of from day one is a predator um, and that doesn't end as he gets older. Um, It continues and it's just how he sort of adapts that to sort of what the current power dynamic is, is that's what changes, that's what shifts. And he feels pretty confident about being able to sort of get away with the stuff because he's never really been called to account before. And so he kind of falls right into Audra's trap um, because of that. There's this one, I think it's early in the book, so I can, I can mention it, where Audra recounts what Max did to a previous student. Mm. And it's that she came in and she was a good artist, but she, something was wrong. And he began giving, paying her these attentions and eventually gave her this cathartic release in front of the whole class saying, you're broken. Something about you is broken. What's going on? And she starts bawling. And I think popular culture would say, oh, isn't he great? And (laughs) you know, he really cares about her, but this beautiful, you know, you've, you've shown that that's not a great thing to do. (laughs) I love that perspective of like, no, no, that's not interest. That's just stealing her pain for his art. I thought that was great. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, I think in that scene in particular, where he's really kind of work you know working with I think it's kind of more like working over this student like really giving her a hard time when she's clearly struggling with something that she's not she hasn't brought um sort of consensually to the classroom to talk about but she is upset visibly upset and that there is a sort of theater of um exploration and sort of um catharsis that sometimes it's helpful to people and other times when you're putting someone on the spot and trying to step in as some sort of um, savior in front of other people it can be really damaging and and really selfish too it reminds me of um nixium the cult has this thing called engineered epiphany (laughs) where you can see the thing about someone that's broken anyone can see that Mm -hmm. and you you know, when you, when someone comes to you for help, you know what the thing is and their engineered epiphany is showing that thing to them and acting like they're the God, they can fix them. But I think in some ways is patriarchy a cult? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You might be onto something. Um, And, and I think too, like with, with Max's thing is not only, you know, the thing that sort of makes him even more sort of, you know, troubling and difficult and horrible in a lot of ways is that not only does he sort of push for these sort of um show me your pain you know this kind of thing kind of positing himself as a some kind of um confidant but he he he's a user right I mean he uses that stuff to then elevate his own positioning in the art world right he paints things that sort of inspire him and what tends to inspire him of course is like the pain of others because he's kind of he's a, not a good guy right and so it's it's sort of a double whammy of not only sort of kind of um making somebody go through that experience publicly in, in a lot of ways um but it's also then making it even more public but couching it in well I'm gonna look at I can I'm gonna make you live on forever in my art and how lucky are you to get to be that person (laughs) and then I like that line where he's doing that earlier with Cora and Jupiter says but he's not that good he really isn't someone who should be taking anyone (laughs) under his wing (laughs) right yeah there's it's true it's like I and I think that's where sort of these other voices the other perspectives are sort of really fun and also helpful for orientation a little bit to sort of be like yeah like Max thinks one thing of course about himself and other people think other things about Max and you get to sort of see a little bit of that. So Audra is so tough. Like she's this amazing character who's gonna, has an, has an instinct. She's got a plan for Max. She's taken him away for the weekend. Yeah. I love her. Where did you come up with her? What that inner strength, what yeah. was the impetus for that? Um, I think it was just, I, I, was like, I, I love a good revenge movie. 
I love your death wishes. I love your takens. And in those stories and those tellings, the men in those stories are given total license to be totally laser focused, to not really have to think about a moral compass, right? The sort of whole framework of the movie is that they're doing the right thing, no matter what it costs, um, no matter what the collateral damage is. What they're after is sort of what we're as the sort of audience supposed to be like, yeah, like it's terrible, but also like go get them. And that's what I wanted to do. I love those stories. And I was like, I want a story where it's a woman doing this, where she is so self-assured about what she has experienced and what she feels about what should be done next in terms of justice, that she's going to just do it and is not going to feel bad about it. And it was really fun to write that. (laughs) It was really fun to read too. (laughs) I kept, I was like, she's so stone cold, but I love it. Yeah. I I don't know if you want to talk about the moment with the moose, but that's a great moment. Yeah. Uh, So there is a, there's a moment fairly early on in the book where um, Audra and Max have arrived at Audra's home in Maine. And uh, she's like, oh, I really want to take you out sort of in the twilight hours, because that's when you're most likely to see interesting wildlife like moose and things like that. And so he takes, uh, she takes him on this drive on these back roads in this, in the Moosehead Lake region of Maine. That's where it's supposed to be set, which is a real area in Maine, Moosehead Lake and, and the surrounding area. And um, there are moose and, and things like that around there. And um, so basically they're driving along this rutted sort of dark road and um, they hear this sort of squonk squonking noise and like gosh what is that and they figure out that it's a baby moose and they see this baby moose is by himself this calf and um they drive up a little further and the headlights start to illuminate that there's a the the mother moose in the ditch and she's been probably clipped by a by a a logging truck and is and is very injured and is not going to make it and audra is really kind of um, brave about it and gets out of the car and investigates and Max is really scared and doesn't want to get out of the car and doesn't want to interact with it and just wants to leave and um, Audra uh, sort of in this quick moment uh, she sort of reveals that she has a gun and she puts the moose out of its misery uh, right in front of Max's eyes and it's a, it's a moment, uh, I think, that really sets the tone for maybe what Max is in for and what kind of woman Audra is um, now that he's alone with her up there. It's great. It's great. And it has, it has nice resonance, too. Mm. I, I thought it was terrific. Um, yeah, I, I <laughs> love Moosehead Lake, Maine, too. So I love that you said it there. Yeah. Beautiful place. Does it, I remember it having fresh water. I know this is an aside. But is that when I was a kid, I went there in like I think the 80s. that's true. Gosh, I don't, I think that's true. I don't know. Anybody was, who's a Mainer who's watching, if I'm wrong, they're going to want to kill me, but I'm not sure. I think so. You know, it's been years, but I remember like drinking it. It was crazy. It's yeah, so it's beautiful It's a there. gorgeous, beautiful area. It's incredible. Um, yeah, the Audra thing is great. And I, I'm kind of thinking as you were talking about it of, I don't know if you've ever, ever seen the movie A Most Violent Year. I haven't. I've heard of it, but I've not seen it. It's, it's, um, it's these two characters, they're married and they're in a rough spot. And I think they hit a deer or something Mm -hmm. and they get out and the husband is going to shoot the deer and he can't. And she's like, get out of the way. And she grabs the gun and shoots the deer. Gotcha. And it's terrifying. And I, I wonder, there's something that makes violence feel more real, maybe in the language of film and possibly in the language of literature when women commit it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I think um, I think there's something to that. I think it's it, for some reason it still sort of has the ability to, I think, sort of, if not shock, but to sort of like startle when when a woman sort of commits violence on screen or or um, in a book, and especially in a way that's sort of, sort of not out of um, a hair trigger response to something when it's sort of thought about and just kind of done. Uh, matter it's not like defending their young. Right, exactly. When it's not <laughs> when sort of defending, okay. exactly when it's it's something else. I think it's it kind of takes people off guard a little bit sometimes. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about the the present time piece. Um, the juniper, or it's not juniper. Is it what's the Lupin name of the valley? valley? 
Yep. What Lupin is it? Valley. Lupin Valley. Lupin. I keep Lupin Valley. So, so at this arts collective, um, 30 years prior to the main events are this large cast of characters that you sort of whittle down yep. and, you know, we get snippets of, of what actually happened um, in a fascinating way. Um, I'm kind of curious about, like, it reminded me a little bit of Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. And there's this thing, I know you and I both got our MFAs in creative writing, where some places when there are no rules, in fact, it's, it's totally the strongest survive. Mm -hmm. It's not as egalitarian as they pretend. Yeah. And I think too, I think the thing that kind of comes through a little bit with, with the campers and I think in, you know, perhaps MFA programs and stuff is there's definitely sort of a cult of personality kind of thing going on at these places where, um, you know, the, yeah, strong personalities or sort of the person who has sort of, um, I don't know, a real point of view, whether the point of view is good or interesting or not, but if they're really confident about it, um, tend to sort of be tone setters, I think, for the group in some ways. Um, and then it does become about how do you navigate around this person who's a real force um, in, in, the, in the program, whether it's at a camp like this and uh, or, or, in, or in other settings. I think that's, that's very true. I think how people interact, there's a, there people want, or not want to, but I think people tend to, a leader tends to sort of elect themselves somehow and people tend to follow, I think. I don't know, from my own experience, it was also that um, everybody wanted it so bad. Mm. You know, there was this like, only one of us will be, it's Thunderdome, you know? <laughs> And yep. th they would align themselves with whoever the teacher said was their favorite. I don't know if you had that. Interesting. Yeah, that's very I was, I was never the teacher's favorite. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's fascinating. And I, yeah, I think like, you know, with these artists, you also have this interplay of, you have one of the instructor, Juniper, kind of falling prey to this as well, where maybe she's not even the leader of the group and she's very close with all the painters, but there's one painter in particular who really kind of rises to be the person who sets the tone, I think, for the group and what happens for that rest of that summer and year that they're there. There are a couple of personalities um, and they're malignant in different ways. Mm. And you sort of, um, they sort of conspire in ways I felt, do you want to, you know, I don't want to give too much away because it's great, you know? Um, okay. Do you want to give me like a little sure. hint into what thinking you're about, about Moss and I'm thinking about the other guy, uh, Mantis. Mantis. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, in particularly in the, in the 1988 Lupin Valley sort of setting, you're, I think you're absolutely right that there's sort of different types of malignancy within the group. And I think you have Moss and who is sort of um, somebody who's really super ambitious. He's a camper, he's there for his art. He's sort of just into his art, getting better, wanting to become a big name, wanting to become successful and famous, kind of no matter what it takes. Um, and no matter uh, who it might harm. And then you have Mantis, who is a sort of a townie who works at the camp and he is a cook there and he kind of falls in with this painter group as well. And his sort of aggressiveness is more overt in some ways, but no, but sort of equally um, problematic as, as Mosses, these two guys. And they're sort of two sides of the same coin where, um, unfortunately their sort of toxicity sort of focuses in on one camper in particular coral um, but how that that manifests is very different and how they handle their relationship to the, the cause the, the, the sort of harm they're causing is very different as well and then there's also juniper herself the the instructor who maybe is not sort of doing anything overtly harmful to coral but is also in this really kind of, I find her character to be 
particularly um, almost painful to sort of read and 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 this only in the sense that she feels so human and so like the rest most of the rest of us which is a person who doesn't want harm to come to other people but sometimes we're not the best at stepping in when we see harm being done especially when it's done at sort of microaggressive levels and things like that so you know then there's the sort of question of complicity and how guilty is a person who who sees something is wrong and doesn't speak up or do something about it too it's it's very well rendered um and we get a lot of jupiter's story yeah which i liked seeing it through her perspective because she seemed to have she's the best person to tell that story through it seems yeah i think so too and again i feel like she's i think like most of us out on the outside of the book where you're put in a difficult situation and you have to sort of figure out how do I navigate what I'm seeing and experiencing in, in a real way. Yeah. Yeah. She had tough options though. I'm kind of, I'm like, it's she pretty did. hard for Jupiter. I don't know. She what had she very tough options. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and then we have Coral, who is um, sort of the, the center of, of the past story yeah. in that everyone, uh, she gets her voice mostly through notes that she writes and leaves around. Yeah. Um, oh, talk about the notes a little bit because they're great. <laughs> yeah, so Coral um, is a character who is mostly rendered through sort of like found objects, mostly in the, in the form of notes. Um, and in the book, they're sort of described sort of what they are physically as well. So it'll be, it'll say like um, torn sheet of loose leaf paper or sticky note or whatever. Um, and, and it'll say, have her little um, scrawls on it. And um, when I first was drafting the book, she had a full point of view, just like the rest of the, the main narrators, like full chapter length kind of stuff. And then we figured out that she might be more impactful um, if she was sort of more sort of succinct and sort of boiled down to this real essence of, of what she's about. And I think that's, that was right. Um, and so we get the, this, this choral character through all of these found notes that are direct from her perspective. And you get a kind of get a sense of where they're found contextually in space. Um, and then they become incorporated as we, you sort of learn very quickly um, into the, um, uh, Audra's thesis paintings um, as part of what makes them up uh, and that becomes part of the story in the present as well. It's great. It's great because there's so many little surprises from that. Um, I feel like I like the Quirrell's story was told that way in particular because it, it begs the question of who gets to tell this story. Mm. And she doesn't. Right. And I think that's interesting. Like, um, I, I feel like a lot of your, your novel is about that. Whose story is it? And then yeah. that's the question of art is, is uh, the people who don't have access have just as valid stories, but art tends to favor white men. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's, it's true. And I think that was one of the things that was sort of tricky for, for me to sort of think about and deal with too, is that, you know, Coral, uh, you know, is her own person and has her own, her, she's a fully formed person and has her own aspirations and dreams and thoughts and, and, and all this. And so we get sort of this sort of main line into her perspective through these notes, but ultimately they are sort of like curated by somebody else. And that's sort of like a big part of the framing of the book is that they are curated by somebody else. And so you have to, it, it is an interesting question of, um, you know, yeah, whose story gets to be told and what, what ends up happening to that story once it's been transfigured in that kind of way as well. It's also important to say like, the story is so much about like knocking that down in like yeah. an amazing fun way and like a <laughs> surprise and I'm like, oh my God. I can't believe this happened and all this different <laughs> stuff goes on and you keep reading. You're going like, what? They know this person, this person is really this person. This note said this, yeah. you know, there's, it's like all these heady ideas, but they're crystallized 
in, you know, a, what fiction is supposed to do, which is a really compelling story that's not hitting you over the head. It's oh, just, you're just you. enjoying the story. <laughs> Yeah, it was really fun to write and put all of it together. It was hard. <laughs> it was really tricky and challenging, but it was like really fun to do too. Yeah. I, I bet. I bet. I read in your blog um, that uh, you felt like you were, uh, there's something called a genre gutter, which I felt very much um, when I was coming out. I'm surprised mm-hmm. it still existed when you were, but yeah, there's there's a real pressure to write what's considered literary fiction. And I think yeah. that's because that's who the universities hire is people who write literary fiction. It's not, right. you know, that's what they know how to do. That's what they're like prone to teaching you and prone to favoring because those are the people, that's what they get. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it was one of those things where I am super, you know, I'm super grateful for the fact that I got to go through the programs at UMaine and at Notre Dame and really get to sort of like read super interesting varied things and and really sort of interact and and workshop with really interesting different kinds of writers. But I think, you know, everybody, every, no matter what group you go to, whether it's your sort of friend group, who's your writing group, or if it's at a university, there's a perspective involved um, and a culture involved in terms of what is curated for reading lists and what is how, how we think about writing and, and also how we think about professionalizing too. I, I felt like there was a real, um, you know, emphasis on, you know, the path, if there is to be one as a writer is via being a professor who writes and publishes books as part of sort of their tenure track uh, experience and not as as being a writer in and of itself not to say that you know we're all gonna be able to quit our jobs and become full-time writers but but this idea that um, not really any sort of emphasis on professionalizing just for publishing outside of academia which I had to really kind of unlearn a lot of that once I left school I oh same thing and it's also just the worst possible advice you should only be a writing teacher if you really want to because it does not yes. pay well like what yes. were they thinking you should have been like <laughs> be a lawyer and also right. write if you want to right. do that. Like exactly. I, <laughs> but that was yeah. the thing. It was like, there were these coveted spots to get like, like assistantships with the creative writing professors. So one day you could get a job and it was only right. the favored writers. And it was like, this is the worst. Like <laughs> this can't be how the system works. Can <laughs> Why it? are people <laughs> fighting over this job? Like, <laughs> right. And, and I think that was the thing too. I was like, you know, and I think that was, a, I had a real uh, kind of good clarifying moment uh, like several years ago when I was actually in the process of drafting this book, which was, I was working full time at an office job like I am now. And um, I was also part-time adjuncting in the English department in creative writing, which was really lovely and fun, but I was also trying to draft this book. And there, I know there are the, there are people who can do all three of those things phenomenally well, plus they maybe have kids plus whatever. And I, I, I bow at the feet of those people, but I was finding that um, between, you know, working 40 hours a week and then wanting to do a really good job teaching, teaching is really draining. It's really rewarding, but it's really draining and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of energy. And I was just realizing that I'm not writing as much or as quality as I would like to if that's really what my dream is is to like publish a book and so I had to like decide like do I want to keep doing teaching on the side which I love and it also is a little extra scratch right which is helpful always helpful Um, or do I want to sort of like focus down a little bit and 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 do away with that and for the time being at the at the very least and, and focus on writing and that's what I did and it was a real lesson in like you know, what most people do, what Kurt, the Kurt Vonnegut's and all those people did, you work a job <laughs> and you write and you figure it out. And that's okay too. You don't have to be part of academia to become like a writer with a capital W, whatever that means. Right. So, um, so I think that was like, again, just something I had to sort of like live and learn and <laughs> kind of figure out over time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I couldn't do that. Poss- I couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> It's so, so hard. You, <laughs> but you've published, you've, you've been writing successfully for a long time now. I mean, this is your debut thriller, but you've, yeah. you've done a lot of work. Yes. Yeah, that is true. I, I mean, I've, I've always, you know, like most writers, I've always like 
written, you know, just because it's you, it's you, it interests you and it's like sort of your hobby. So even when I was a kid, I was writing, of course, and all this stuff. And and then probably starting in like, yeah, 20, 2009, 2010, I started publishing short stories in different little outfits here and there. Um, and, and through school was drafting sort of book length stuff. And I published um, a sort of an innovative fiction work in 2016 called American Vaudeville, which I'm really proud of. And through Mammoth Books and 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 so I've I've done a lot of writing. I've done a lot of different. I wrote um, I wrote a romance novel one time and self published that, and that was really kind of fun. And, and set in Maine, right? Play. And it was set in Maine, and it was like my my best friend Megan like helped gave me this idea. She works in the film industry, and I had she it was just this great idea she had, and I was like, oh, this would be great. I should just try this for fun, and I did. And it was like a great experience to try something different and learn other conventions and 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 work on character and plotting and all those things and and so anyway I've written a lot of stuff I've written very widely um but th this is sort of the first sort of like commercial thing that's kind of popped up above the fray but yeah I think like most writers it's one of those things that you were doing for a really long time before um you get the sort of politics and prose event with Sarah Langan kind of thing to happen <laughs> I'm excited to be at a politics and prose <laughs> event. Thank it's you for inviting great. me. <laughs> it's so awesome. Um, so you're in Bangor. What what is your what's your routine like, and do you have one a writing each routine? Sure. So I I really admire and sort of romanticize people who have like a routine, and I wish I was one of those people. Um, I am uh, I, I sort of am one of those get it where you can typewriters. Um, and, um, and I kind of call myself a tea kettle writer where I can sort of sit and burble and think and ruminate for a really long time. And then it feels like the pressure builds and I'm ready to kind of let it fly. And then I can write for really long jags and kind of get a lot done. Um, and other times I am pretty consistent, but it's, it's really all over the place. And I tried being one of those, like get up at 5 AM and do it every day or whatever. And I just like, couldn't do it. So, um, yeah, it really is really kind of kind of erratic and I don't have a real routine except that I try to read a lot as much as I can and I'm a slow reader so it takes me longer anyway to sort of do that. So I do that and I write when I can and when I'm not writing sort of stuff that I would consider kind of heading toward what I would want to be published. I do a lot of fan fiction writing because I just find that fun and it kind of just kind of keeps everything loose and kind of limber. <laughs> Can I ask what fan fiction? Yeah, I mean, I like to write, I've done like lost fan fiction, you know, I've done like, I love like the Pendergast um, series of novels by Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. I've done some of that kind of stuff. I've dabbled in Harry Potter fan fiction. So, you know, it's all over the place. I just really, it's just so fun to sort of work in a, something that's already up and running and you can kind of just jump in <laughs> and kind of be like, what would happen if? And you just keep going and it's fun. Well, it's good to have some, to relate to your work with joy too. Yes. I feel like if you're not, if you're coming into it, like I have to get it right. And I have to, it has to be, as opposed to just being like, I freaking love Harry Potter so yeah, much. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what would have happened in Baltimore? Like <laughs> that's, and That's you know, one of that. the, one of the kind of interesting things now sort of in retrospect thinking about is like, I realized that in a lot of those, even in those sort of like sandbox spaces, right. And sort of in fan fiction, it's like, I was, I have written a lot of female characters who are like tough as hell and out to like do some damage for the side of the good as I saw it in those books. And I feel like that really kind of did build up into Audra, I think in this book, whatever you may think of Audra by the end of the book, um, I'm glad she sort of is who she is. <laughs> I, I love her. I love her. I think there was some review that that included, included you in, as the new novels about feminine rage. Yeah. That That's is pretty true. fun. I know. I was like, I kind of love, I love it. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So other questions. Um, people can start posting questions and the chat if they want to. Um, but in the meantime, so when you write, do you just 
sit down at your desk? Do you need the same place? Is this where you write right here, your office? This is sometimes where I write uh, up here in like the attic office space. Um, but honestly, a lot of time it's just like me on my laptop, like on the couch or in bed. I do like a lot of that kind of writing where I'm like very cozy um, and sort of just like, yeah, on the couch or in bed writing. I do a, like a ton of drafting that way. And then I feel like when I, like with this book in particular, when I was getting more complicated in terms of the plotting and I needed like, I felt like more formal, like, I don't know, space to think about stuff, then I like kind of moved to a desk for some reason and kind of try to plot out what's going on. <laughs> That's, I love I love sitting in a bed. It turns out I had the wrong thing open and you have many questions. So <laughs> <laughs> let me start. Um, okay, this is a great one. As you, as you well know, in Maine, there's an imagined barrier between those who are from here and from away. Mm. I see this in the differences in how you write the artist versus the camp staff, as well as Audra versus Max. Can you talk about how your experience as a Brooklyn to Maine transplant has tr transformed your writing of these characters and their sense of place? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think, let's see, I think one of the, I think, great things about Mainers, and, I, and I, you kind of hear it as a cliche, but I think it's really true, is that uh, Maine people tend to be like quite self-sufficient and they tend to be quite, um, just sort of get on with it at a certain point, what if, if it's difficult or if it's hard, like Maine living is not always easy. It's historically been very hard, hard winters, a lot of farmers, things like that, fishermen, things like that. So there's a lot of kind of no nonsense-ness to Maine people, which I really love. And I think um, that is sort of writ large, I think in Audra in a lot of ways, and, um, and probably in some of the other characters as well um for sure and then in terms of sort of coming from Maine to uh, coming from New York rather to Maine I think one of the things I've thought about in the process of writing this book is how when I I was born in Brooklyn and lived in Brooklyn until I was eight and you sort of this sort of the hustle and bustle and the noise and things like that and I remember as a child in Brooklyn not being afraid of being in Brooklyn where I think when I moved to Maine, a lot of Mainers were like, oh my God, Brooklyn, are there even trees there? Like, how did you survive? Like, what is it dangerous? And I was like, it's just a place where you live and it's wonderful and all those sorts of things. And so when I got here though, I found that the fear I didn't have in Brooklyn did start to manifest in anxiety when I was a little kid here because it was so quiet and so remote. And we moved to a place called Exeter when we first moved to Maine. And it was like, it's a tiny town with very few people and you can hear a car coming from a mile away. And I just remember thinking as a kid, oh, like, this is like where we die. This is like the guy with like the hatchet <laughs> and like, and something about the quiet and something, just something very distinct coming out of that quiet was so much scarier to me than living in like a major metropolis where like probably per capita the crime is like worse, right? Um, so that I think is something that kind of really drew me also to the remoteness of the setting of Maine as well. I have a quick anecdote, which is Please. that. <laughs> that when I was going to school in Maine, I was really used to there being no people around. Mm -hmm. And so I went to visit a friend at college in Boston and the party was so packed. You had to squeeze in. And I remember going to my friend, I can't breathe. <laughs> we have to go. This is too many yeah. people. So, you do get used to sort of the expansiveness of Maine, which it is. I mean, it is you know, there are, of course, cities in Maine, of course, and things like that, but you get a few miles outside of any of the, of the cities in Maine, and you're like, oh, well, like, I'm in, I'm basically in the woods again, like, it's really amazing, like, it's pretty rural in most of, in most of Maine. One more question, where in Brooklyn did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in Windsor Terrace, which is uh, adjacent to Park Slope. I was born in Park Slope at Methodist Hospital, which is where my mom was born and where she worked as a NICU nurse as well. And uh, so, yeah, that was the area that we were in. Um, so I was in Crown Heights for 10 years before moving to LA and Methodist was our hospital. Hey, <laughs> all these like synchronicities, man. It's so crazy. Okay, here's the next question. When you're writing, are you writing for any audience in particular? Who is the one person you hope your book reaches? Oh, wow. 
Um, I, I don't think I really write with an audience in mind, except to say that I think it's such good advice. I've heard other people say it. I, I agree, which is, you know, write the book you would want to read. Um, and so I think I try to do that if it's the kind of book that I feel like, oh, I'd be so jazzed about reading myself, the, um, then I kind of feel pretty happy. And then um, so I guess like as sort of, I don't know if that's like super self-involved way to say like me, I just <laughs> I write for me, but it's more about sort of saying writing toward your joy. I think what you were saying earlier about like if it's something that really makes you happy and that you're, you're interested in, I think that's the best way to, to measure that. Audience I, think I think you do kind of touch on Jupiter's dilemma in, in your book is, is she seeing something going wrong and what do you do yeah. that I think, you know, may have, will have impact. And so in that way too. Yeah. I think the more I wrote Juniper and the more I thought about, it, I was like, Ooh, I think this is like a lot of my anxieties of being a sort of middle class is white woman in a world that's full of a lot of problems that feel really hard to tackle but also that on at some level systemically I am complicit in and and I think that you know it's not about me and feeling sad for myself but it's about saying yeah I think there's a lot of work and inward stuff to be thought about when you think about these dynamics in the world and and uh, Juniper I think is a person who kind of goes through a lot of that uh, in a sort of very pointed sort of acute way in this book in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, it's hard writing now from, from a white woman's perspective, because you keep thinking, maybe I don't have it right at all. Like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also like, you know, do, and, you know, is my voice the one that's needed right now? I don't know. Um, but uh, you know, there's only, you know, what can you do <laughs> Yeah, at, at that level? Yeah. Except support and uplift, uh, you know, other writers. So I have a question and you can put a pin in it while you think about it, because you may want to take a minute, but it, they, I think they're shifting all around. Oh, okay. I'm so excited about the trend of women taking back power in narrative and fiction writing. Are there any stories or authors that inspired you early on in this respect? Yeah. So I think uh, the person who was sort of the big, and I think that this person was the person for a lot of people, but the person who really sort of like, well, blew my brain apart was Gillian Flynn. And uh, the first book of hers I read was, um, was the big one was Gone Girl. And then I read the rest of her catalog. And she just is so, I mean, she's a master. She, she is, she knows how to write women who are sharp and smart and um, tough and and also find themselves embroiled in really complicated difficult harrowing situations and 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 kind of for better or worse finding their way through those in some way and um so i for me she's one of the early big influences for sure i can see some sharp objects too yeah i can see that yeah for sure yeah Okay, what makes a good antagonist in 2021? Someone mm. believable and not like a cartoon villain? Any tips for writers? It's, oh. That's a trick question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think like, um, I think, you know, the, again, the old sort of advice of sort of, you know, if, if someone's just purely a monster, um, it's not as interesting uh, if it's just sort of, this thing you can point to that's sort of like they're horrible there's no redeeming qualities it's easy to pin the sort of badness on them that's you know it can it can be effective but it can also be a little boring and I think the best villains I mean I would I mean I wonder I this is a great question I think in terms of good neighbors too because I there's villainy but is there a villain in in good neighbors and I think of Rhea a bit in terms of these questions and um and if you haven't read good neighbors you should it's incredible um that's sarah's book and and but i th i think it's a, a person who is doing a lot of times a villain is a person who's doing to their absolute fullest the thing they believe to be okay and right even if it's not <laughs> I, you know, I think, I think there's these trends in modern psychology and right now the trend is like, everybody sees themselves as their own hero 
And usually when they're doing things, they're acting out of self-preservation yes. or a false narrative. Yes. I mean, it may not be true. It's like, it's like child rearing where it's like, you know, one year you're supposed to do this and it makes total sense. And the next year, if something changes, like there's right. probably some happy medium where in fact you, you also are culpable for your own decisions. Right. No, it's true. But I think there, there, there's something to be said. It is. I could see that being a trend though in terms of what we see sometimes, what we're seeing in, in fiction sometimes. And there's a lot of hay to be made there, I think. <laughs> well, it's also just fun to write, right? You can, yeah. you can like Megan Abbott is, is a master at like, they had no idea what they were doing while they were doing it. And they thought right. they were doing it for this reason, but they weren't. But they weren't. Yeah, that's true. Okay. What is your process for character development when you have this many, when you have this many complex characters? Are their personalities and character pretty well defined early on, or do they sort of reveal themselves as the story evolves? Yeah, it's for me, it's definitely the revealing end of the spectrum. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get better at sort of doing some pre work um, just to make my life easier down the road when I'm drafting, but I tend to be sort of a, a by, by the seat of your pants type of drafter and the voices, um, tend to lead me there um so what a person what what the character sounds like and especially if you're doing a first person and it's in multiple perspectives that stuff starts to kind of emerge on its own a little bit organically as well as you go around as you go along um so in terms of sort of developing them further um i think you know it, it happens from a lot of drafting and redrafting and then um you know certainly in publishing you get feedback from an editor who helps you kind of parse out what somebody's uh, thing is and sort of how to emphasize or de-emphasize certain things to make it more crisp and more clear. So you get help too when you get to sort of a level where you're publishing through a through a publisher like that. Um, but for me, it is mostly just a lot of writing and rewriting. And um, I've never been really good at doing this sort of like pre sort of questionnaire type stuff about characters, which I think is really fun, but I just never kind of get there myself when I'm doing it. I don't know, what's your process for characterization? Do you have like a specific one? I think we're similar writers in that I kind of don't know until yeah. the plot takes me somewhere. It's like you kind of, you have this character and then you want this thing to happen to them. So you write it until then. And then you think, well, either the, that thing has to change because it's yeah. not the character or the character has to change because yeah. I want this thing to happen. Yeah. And it's just a kind of constant, you know, by the time I finish a draft, it's done but it takes me a much longer. That might be you too. And yeah. These people who come out and they're like drafted it like right. in a month. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think that's, it's, it's really sort of about the, yeah, the cause and effect and how things weave together and interact. And it's like, I, when I've taught in the past, I've kind of described it to students as, you know, a story is like an ecosystem. And so when one thing happens over here, it's going to somehow impact what's happening over here. And I think as you start to shift along in your story, as things start to reveal themselves, think you start to see how things need to realign um, to work in the ecosystem. All right. Uh, what books did you read during the process of writing this book? Um, let's see. I read, I read a bunch. Um, I'm trying to think gosh, back, way back then when I was drafting it, that was a long time ago now at this point. But over the course of the last several years, I've read, um, let's see, I've read Ruth Ware. I've read Sarah Langan. I've read um, Peter Swanson. I've read, I love Stephen King. Maybe that's very cliche for a person from Maine to say, but Stephen King is great. Love Stephen King's books. So I read It. Uh, during this time period and was like deeply impacted by love it um, so a lot of different stuff but mostly thrillers I also recently read um, Hidden Valley Road which was about um, sort of a case study of a schizophrenic family and sort of also a, a sort of the history of the diagnosis of schizophrenia as well which was really interesting I don't know that it really played into this particular book but it was like in the in the air as I was kind of going through edits and stuff like that I liked Hidden Valley Road a lot. Yeah, really it's interesting. Poignant. But actually, I, I could see some connections because you are you yeah. know, dealing with a mentally ill character. and Right. Very true. Yeah. This is the last question that I see. 
Speaking of feminine rage, have you read Animal by Lisa Tadeo, if I'm pronouncing that right? And if so, what are your thoughts? I haven't, so I don't have anything cogent or, or anything to say, but I've heard about it. I have not read it. It's on my, it's on my TBR pile, I would say. Hey, y'all. Um, so as that was our last um, audience Q&A, um, I actually do have one more question from us. Um, we at the store, and, and I'm totally springing this on you. So if you don't have an answer, that's just fine. Um, but we are a bookstore. Um, we, you know, sell books. And so I'm wondering if you have any, uh, anything that you're reading right now that, um, you would recommend to our audience members? Sure. So I am in the middle of, um, Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby, which I'm loving. And, um, I really, uh, I'm, this is not just because Sarah's here. I, I genuinely wholeheartedly full-throated recommend Good Neighbors by Sarah Langan. It's phenomenal. It's the exact kind of book I love reading. It hits all of my buttons. It's smart. It's satiric, but it also has a real dark undertone. The characters are fascinating. Some real stuff goes down, some real dark stuff goes down, but it also sort of really illuminates who the characters are in the book. So for real, for real, S.A. Cosby, Sarah Lang, and that's who are sort of where I'm at right now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sarah, do you have any recommendations right now? Dark Things I Adore. <laughs> that's number one. Um, I read it the second time and I was like, can't put it down. Can't, can't put it down. I love it. Um, and then I'm, I'm finishing up Library at Mount Char, uh, which is a spectacular masterpiece. Um, it's the stand for, for a modern era. It's got an entire religious philosophy in it, mm. but it's a thriller. It was written in 2016. It's insane. I don't understand why it's not famous. It's nuts. What's the name of it again? The Library at Mount Char. The Library. It's getting, it's coming out in England, like they, like four years later, they're like, this is good. We have to, we have to publish this. So, but it, it's been out in the States since 2016. Okay. Awesome. I think you'd that like it. a brand new one. Yeah. Or that's a brand new one that I'm hearing of. So that's awesome. It's a great wreck. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I unfortunately think it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you both. Uh, it's, you know, not every uh, weeknight evening that we have two very cool people and a, mm -hmm. um, a, uh, conversation that argues the question is patriarchy a cult? Um, I gasped <laughs> in my seat. <laughs> I loved that. <laughs> um, to all of our, um, audience members out there on zoom and on YouTube, we thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'll just remind everybody, um, that the link to purchase dark things I adore is in the chat. Um, politics and prose is, is so proud and happy to have this tradition of events, but really without the book sales to support them, um, they're difficult to put on. So, uh, we, we really thank you for any purchases that come from this event, from our awesome recommendations and, um, from the, the book of the evening. Um, congratulations, Katie Letary on your, uh, publication tomorrow. Um, thank Sarah Langan, thank you so much for moderating tonight. Um, and from, us to you. We, we really hope that you stay safe, stay well, and stay well read, everybody. <laughs>